headlines. Korea and the ASEAN announced a joint statement to wrap up their commemorative summit, outlining a vision to upgrade their strategic partnership and to further open up their markets. Korean Air's former vice president, who stepped down from the post over her nut rage incident, appears for government questioning and asks the public for forgiveness. And the CIA's director acknowledges abhorrent abuses by his agency, but defends the overall interrogation program for stopping attacks and saving lives. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News and live from Seoul. I am Kang Teddy. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Let's start with the end to this week's Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit, where leaders from ASEAN countries and President Bakune adopted a joint statement today. And a big part of that statement outlines a set of agreements aimed at bolstering their economic, cultural, and social ties. Our Hwang Sung Yi starts us off. Noting that the launch of the ASEAN Economic Community next year will become a new growth engine for the global economy, leaders of South Korea and 10 Association of Southeast Asian Nations agreed to bolster economic cooperation. In a joint statement following the Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit on Friday, the leaders vowed to work towards swift negotiations for additional liberalization of the Korea ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. 이를 위해 2015년 말까지 목표로 하고 있는 한 아세안 FTA 추가 자유화 협상의 순조로운 진행과 무역 원활화 및 제도 개선을 통해 현재 1,350억 불의 교육 규모를 2020년까지 2,000억 불로 확대키로 하였습니다. President Park Geun-hye promised to simplify visa regulations for Southeast Asians entering Korea from the first day of 2015 and noted a new deal on two-way consular cooperation. 또한 양측은 인적 교류 연 700만 시대를 맞아 관광객, 기업인, 정부 인사, 유학생, 그리고 근로자 등 양측 국민에 대한 영사 협력을 강화해 나가기로 하였습니다. The South Korean leader outlined Seoul's commitment to share its experiences with the so-called Semaul movement, which is an initiative that dates back to 1970s and is credited with helping modernize the nation's economy. She also vowed to invite about 100 people from the science and engineering fields each year for training programs in Korea. And to carry out these projects, President Park said South Korea will increase its contribution to the ASEAN South Korea Cooperation Fund by 2 million U.S. dollars to 7 million starting next year. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News, Busan. And their joint vision for a strategic partnership also discusses some other pressing issues as well. They include some heady problems, including security challenges like North Korea's nuclear program and others such as climate change and disaster management. Che Sun has more of the details. Looking ahead to the next 25 years of their ties, the leaders of Korea and the ASEAN have agreed to work together to become a driving force for peace in East Asia. 동북아와 동남아의 안보가 서로 밀접히 연관되어 있다는 데 인식을 같이 하고 양 지역에서의 지속 가능한 평화와 안정을 조성하기 위해 안보 관련 문제에 대한 협력을 더욱 강화하기로 하였습니다. On North Korea, the two sides stressed the need to reconfirm Pyongyang's willingness to lay down its nuclear arms. The 10 ASEAN members then endorsed President Buck's policies towards the North, which includes nuclearization and reunification of the two Koreas, first by way of trust building and non-political cooperation. South Korea and the ASEAN also decided to include human rights and democratic freedom on the agenda for their recently launched security dialogue. 
The 11 leaders in Busan spend some time on non-traditional issues as well. The future challenges are not only related to current traditional security challenges, but also on non-traditional challenges such as climate change, environment issues, disaster management and maritime security. President Buck, for her part, laid out a business model to counter the effects from climate change and natural disasters, calling on her counterparts to seize the chance and turn problems into opportunities. The president suggested joint projects to provide eco-friendly energy to remote regions of the ASEAN, help spur their agricultural production and prevent damage from disasters. Back in Seoul on Saturday, President Bak will wrap up her ASEAN diplomacy in summit talks with Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen. The two leaders plan to focus on creating a more favorable environment for Korean companies looking to expand into Cambodia. Choi Yusan, Arirang News, Busan. At the summit, we've seen how the power of the Korean wave has been a force in bringing about closer ties with nations throughout Southeast Asia. That's right. Uh, the first ladies of visiting ASEAN leaders got a chance to experience the culture of Hallyu firsthand. They got some uh, star treatment, and that's uh, literally. Our Konikin tells us more. Ask someone in Southeast Asia what comes to mind when you mention Korea. And the answer is more than likely to be the Korean wave. The region of more than 60 million people was the first outside of Korea to embrace K-pop music back in the late 1990s. The first ladies of the ASEAN member nations got a look at the place where the wave originated during this week's Korea ASEAN summit. Greeted by popular Korean actor Chang geun suk at the Busan Cinema Center, the ladies enjoyed clips of popular Korean movies that were made especially for the event. They said K-pop, K-dramas and K-movies had captured the attention of the younger generation back home and they look forward to what's coming next. They like something very new, very exciting, um, very vigorous, energetic and I think this is why um, the, the, they're very well received by the young ones in Malaysia. As you may know, Korean movies are quite popular in Cambodia. Korean movies also play a role in educating Cambodians, as they view these Korean movies as role models for their lives. It's one reason that the number of tourists from Southeast Asia has been on a steady rise in recent years. Last year, the total reached one and a half million. Citing cultural similarities as one of the main reasons the Korean wave has gained so much popularity throughout Southeast Asia, the first ladies of the ASEAN member nations have expressed hope that the influence of soft power will continue to strengthen cultural ties between Korea and the region. Connie Kim, Arirang News, Busan. Cho hyun now the former vice president of Korean Air, is facing questions from Korea's aviation authorities as we speak over a so-called nut rage incident. Now, this comes after her father, also the CEO of Korean Air, held a press conference earlier in the day and apologized for everything. Kim min reports. Korean Air's now former Vice President Cho hyun appeared before aviation safety inspectors for questioning Friday afternoon. Speaking to reporters, she apologized for her actions and said she would cooperate with the investigation. I am sorry, and I will sincerely cooperate with the probe. I will also apologize in person to the chief purser and cabin crew involved. Jo initially refused to show but changed her mind after prosecutors raided the headquarters of the nation's flagship carrier over concerns of evidence tampering. Her appearance comes after her father, the CEO of Korean Air, Cho yang ho apologized on her behalf at a press conference and vowed that such an incident would not happen again. <laughs> Joe was thrust into the international spotlight about a week ago after making a Korean Air flight from New York to Seoul turn back to the gate after a flight attendant served her nuts in the package instead of on a plate, apparently not following protocol. The government is currently investigating whether her actions broke air traffic safety laws or other regulations. She has also been barred from leaving the country. 
Jo first stepped down from her duties related to flight services over the backlash, but later offered her full resignation. She will also quit all her positions at affiliates of Korean Air. Kim Min Ji, Arirang News. During South Korea's unification minister Ryu Kilche's trip to Washington, the official has stressed that Seoul's plan to peacefully reunite the two Koreas would not involve absorbing Pyongyang. Our Park Ji Won has more. Speaking to reporters in Washington Thursday, South Korea's unification minister Ryu Kilche said strained inner Korean relations in the long term are not beneficial to either side, and the time to change things for the better is now. Next year will mark the 70th anniversary of the nation's liberation from Japan, and it's time to make a breakthrough in inter-Korean relations. The minister said President Park Geun-hye's envisioned unification drive is based on the North and South working and growing together. He stressed that South Korea's push to unify the two Koreas is not an attempt to absorb the North. Earlier this year, the South Korean president said unification would be a bonanza for the two Koreas. But North Korea denounced President Park's drive, saying she wants to absorb the North into the South. I once again want to reiterate that our government's envisioned drive is a peaceful unification, not an absorption plan. However, Minister Liu said South Korea cannot turn a blind eye to North Korea's nuclear ambitions and human rights issues. So efforts to solve those issues will go hand in hand with Seoul's drive to improve inner Korean relations. During his stop in the U.S. Capitol, the South Korean minister met with various U.S. officials, including chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Ed Royce, where he explained South Korea's unification policies and asked for their support. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. When you buy a smartphone, chances are the purchases won't stop there. From protective cases and car chargers to Bluetooth headsets, the aftermarket for smartphones is a booming industry that shows no signs of letting up. Our Shin Zemin tells us more. Virtually everyone has one. These little smartphones that allow us to be connected and to connect. With up to 1.4 billion smartphones having been sold worldwide, it has created another ecosystem that is expanding quite rapidly. From portable rechargers charging the device practically anywhere, to Bluetooth headsets for hands-free phone calls, and smartphone gloves that allow users to use the screen without having to take them off. These are just a handful of the products driving the smartphone accessory aftermarket. I use a sturdy and fashionable case to help protect my phone, but I'm here to check out some other products, including the Bluetooth-related devices. With just a few taps, this Bluetooth speaker is hooked up and you're ready to go. Thinking out loud, maybe we According to U.S.-based ABI research, the global smartphone accessory aftermarket will be worth more than an estimated 50 billion U.S. dollars by the end of the year. The market for these accessories is increasing, despite smartphone shipments dipping as the market reaches maturity. Growth in the smartphone market is forecast to edge down over the next few years to just 6% in 2018. An industry watcher says that while smartphone sales are going one way, the accessories market is going the other. It's not rocket science. Technology is being applied to things we already use. It's not really technical, so they can be created by individuals, and this diversifies the market. While the analyst thinks camera-related products and accessories have the biggest room for growth, he says it's just a matter of how big the market will become. Even the industry's biggest players like Samsung and LG Electronics are hoping these kinds of innovations will boost their profits even as the smartphone market slows. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. 
The safety concerns at the new landmark Lotte World Tower in southern Seoul are piling up after the latest uproar over leaks to its brand new aquarium. The complex temporarily closed one movie theater. Moviegoers earlier this week complained about the floor and screen shaking and odd noises. Last month, firemen were called in as a visitor reported similar issues. Lotte Cinema said safety inspections would be conducted to determine the cause. Other concerns over cracks in the floors of the still incomplete complex and nearby sinkholes have raised public safety anxieties. Lotte World Tower will become the tallest structure in Korea once completed in 2016. The CIA director has uh, spoken out in defense of his agency following the release of a controversial U.S. Senate report exposing the brutal treatment of terror suspects after September 11th attacks. With more on this story and others, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, there's been widespread condemnation of the intelligence agency from the White House to even the U.N. How did the CIA chief defend these actions? Well, through a press conference, U.S. spy master John Brennan did admit some of the so-called torture tactics described in the report were abhorrent and beyond authorization. But he said the enhanced interrogation techniques were necessary at times to stop deadly terrorism attacks and ultimately save lives. Our Connie Lee reports. The director of the CIA defended his agency in a rare TV press conference on Thursday. The detention and interrogation program produced useful intelligence that helped the United States thwart attack plans, capture terrorists, and save lives. According to John Brennan, that includes useful information that led to the death of Osama bin Laden. However, on the question of whether some of that information was obtained without the use of brutal torture sessions or enhanced interrogation techniques, otherwise known as EITs, Brennan said that was unknowable. Let me be clear. We have not concluded that it was the use of EITs within that program that allowed us to obtain useful information from detainees subjected to them. The director's statements come just two days after the U.S. Senate released a report that said the CIA acted more brutally in its torture techniques of detainees after the 9-11 attacks than it previously acknowledged. Some of the brutal methods described in the report were waterboarding, severe beatings, and a method that led to one detainee to freeze to death. Although the CIA chief said the majority of his agents followed legal advice, he did admit that some actions were not authorized. In a limited number of cases, agency officers used interrogation techniques that had not been authorized, were abhorrent, and rightly should be repudiated by all. One U.S. lawmaker has called for Brennan to quit, while the United Nations and human rights groups are asking for the prosecution of U.S. officials involved in the CIA program from 2001 to 2007. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And turning to Hong Kong, order has returned to the city's financial center after more than two months of pro-democracy protests. Traffic began flowing through Admiralty on Friday after Hong Kong police made good on their promise to clear out the mass of barricades and demonstrators. But activists there have vowed to continue their campaign through other forms of civil disobedience in order to win their demands for fully free elections. I hope through education the public will understand how important democracy is to their life. It is not only about electing the chief executive. It also concerns their daily life, like prices of property, transport and food. Everything is related. I hope through these acts that they will understand a lot of their rights were deprived, so they will join us next time. Police say over 200 people were arrested last night during a final confrontation as authorities dismantled the main protest camp piece by piece. And the follow-up from the massive cyber attack on Sony Pictures Entertainment continues. The company's co-chairman, Annie Pascal, has offered a public apology for remarks targeting U.S. President Barack Obama. According to media website BuzzFeed, a hacked email exchange between Pascal and Oscar-winning producer Scott Rudin pokes fun at the president and which movies he might like, mainly naming films with African-American stars. In a statement on Thursday, entertainment boss Pascal acknowledged the messages were real and expressed regret over the pair's racially insensitive jokes. 
Rudin, known for his work on the social network, No Country for Old Men, and a host of Broadway musicals, also later apologized. The two came under fire by a civil rights activist, Reverend Al Sharpton, who said the comments reflected the continued lack of diversity in positions of power in Hollywood. And finally, a massive storm has hit the west coast of the United States, forcing hundreds of flights to be canceled in what some have just called the worst storm of the decade. The Pacific storm plowed through the drought-stricken California on Thursday, packing winds of up to 230 kilometers per hour, as well as the biggest snowfall in six years. Over 220,000 people had lost power with cities near San Francisco hit hardest by the outages. The extreme weather system is expected to move further south towards Los Angeles and San Diego, raising concerns of mudslides. Officials forecast a range of blizzard and flash flood warnings to last through this weekend. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here next week. Hello and welcome, I'm Stephen Che with a look at sports. All of the events of the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics will stay in Korea. This amid murmurs that the sliding events could be shared with neighboring Japan to save on costs. The Pyeongchang Olympic Games organizing committee head Cho Yang-ho confirmed there were no plans to do that with venue construction already underway. Even North Korea reportedly offered a hand, saying its Mashikbyung ski resort could be used and that sharing events could help reconcile inter-Korean relations. Now, the games have been beset by budget issues. But with South Korea's reputation on the line, the idea of sharing the first Winter Olympics in Asia outside of Japan with another country is not seen as a viable solution. And moving on, expectations were high that pitcher Kim Gwanghyun would be the next Korean export to Major League Baseball. But in the end, a deal couldn't be reached. The 30-day negotiation culminated in the San Diego Padres offering two million U.S. dollars for two years, all guaranteed. But the SK Wyvern's ace declined the offer. That means that Kim will return to his team and put his MLB dreams on hold until the end of next season. Meanwhile, SK will return the $2 million posting fee to San Diego. And heading to the KBL, for the first of a two-game set, the Dongbu Promi faced off against the KCC Aegis in Wonju. Now the Promi fire up and take a double-digit lead by halftime as Yun Ho-young gets hot early. They end up cruising to the end and getting the win to stop their two-game skid. Meanwhile, in Busan, the visiting SK Knights pull the rug from under the KT Sonic Boom as Park sang -ho sinks the buzzer-beating three to pull out the miracle finish. And finally, to football, Real Madrid has been unbeatable as of late, and that might be why 10 of their players, including Cristiano Ronaldo, of course, were tested for doping. According to Spain-based Marca, the winners of 19 straight matches were paid a surprise visit by UEFA anti-doping officials who administered the drug tests. And I think it's safe to say that Ronaldo, with a spectacular 32 goals in 24 contests, was targeted here, as this comes just days after Barcelona's Lionel Messi was tested following his third hat-trick in four matches. And that wraps it up for sports this week. Your weather's up next. Have a great weekend and good night. Hello and welcome. I'm Kim Bo Gyeong with your weather updates. We are wrapping up the week with snow nationwide. In fact, a heavy snowfall watch has been issued for Chungcheongnam-do province where, uh, where over 8 centimeters of snow fell and conditions will clear up by later tonight here in Seoul. But along the west coast, over 15 centimeters of snow may fall and it looks like about 1 to 3 centimeters will fall here in the central regions. Once the flurries taper off, temperatures will take a dip with with daytime highs remaining below zero degrees in summer.
from regions. Now brace ourselves for another round of snow and even colder conditions next week. On to Saturday's readings. Seoul remains at minus 2, Gwangju hits 3, Busan reaches 5. On to other regions. Jeju makes it to 6, Dokdo hits 2, Mount Kumgang drops to minus 12. Be extra careful on the roads. Hope you have a lovely Friday evening. I'll see you soon. And that's primetime news for this Friday. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Kang Chedi. Have a great weekend, everyone. We'll see you again soon.